Someday, I hope to be a mommy. Someday, I want to be a film director and make movies for a living. My dream, someday, is to get a college scholarship for basketball. Well, last week we started a new series called Someday, and that's a word that we generally say a lot about some things that we would like to eventually do when we have enough money, or when we have enough time, or when we have enough experience, or when we have enough knowledge, or when we have kids, or when our kids are grown and gone, but someday usually never comes, and last week we said why that is, that someday is code word for never. Someday really isn't all that important. Someday is nebulous. Uh, Someday is unspecific. Someday is optional. What's important is a day. A day that you put on your calendar that thing that you really want to do because when it makes it on your calendar, you know this, when it makes it on your calendar, it actually makes its way into your life. And when it comes to your spiritual life, there are some things that you probably said that you want to do uh, eventually. Like someday I'm going to join a group. All right, we talked about that last week. We said that that faith is best lived out in the context of community. And if you're not doing that, we want to help you do that. And we're going to have a group launch on Sunday, October 17th. That's where we're going to start our next series called Transformational uh, Prayer. And you can sign up for a group today at the group's table out in the lobby, and we will get you connected into a small group. uh, So you can check that off your spiritual bucket list, okay? Today, we're going to talk about the number one question that we typically get as a church and probably the number one thing that most believers put off in their faith journey because of the confusion around it. So maybe you've said this or you've thought this, someday I'll get baptized. Now, I'm sporting today our new baptism t-shirt, okay? (laughs) I'm kidding. It's just like... It's like a dripping candle wax or something. It, it's, it feels like a haunted shirt. I don't know. But I said a few weeks ago that our new baptistry was dripping, okay? And, and some folks from our worship team found this shirt and were like, you got to wear this. And so, so I did. For those of you who don't have teenagers, dripping is slang for like styling or cool, okay? It doesn't mean that our new baptistry has a leak, all right? <laughs> but I just want to clarify what dripping actually means. So... Um, All right, is this going to throw you off? I need to zip this back up. Baptism has been a confusing topic because different churches teach different things and different churches practice different modes of of baptism. Some of you were sprinkled as an infant. Uh, Some of you were sprinkled as an adult. Uh, Some of you had the pour over. Some of you were fully dunked like we do here. Some of you were fully dunked, but you weren't held under long enough, right? One Mississippi, two, we count to 10, and then we let you up. So I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, uh, I had a guy in my first ministry uh, that came from a tradition where they baptized three consecutive times the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, So we only dunked once, like name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pff, up, And he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it because we didn't do it like his tradition, and and he was just stubborn about it. And uh, when I announced to the church that I'd accepted a position here at Centerpoint and I was going to be leaving, his wife asked me to go have a conversation with him again about baptism, and I did, and went and talked to him. I said, brother, if, if the only thing that's holding you back is two extra dunks, I will dunk you three times. Right? We, we will get it done. I, I will dunk you seven times to represent perfection. All right. You want to go 10 to represent completion? We'll do that. You want to go 12 for the number of God's people? We'll do that. You want to go 40 for every day that Jesus was in the wilderness? I'm going to need backup, and you may not live, but we'll do it. <laughs> we will do it. We settled on three and got it done, but here's my point. He had a filter around baptism that became a hindrance. 
He knew that he, there, he, knew that he needed to do it. That, there was no argument about that at all. He just kept putting it off because of the emotions of doing it differently than the tradition that he grew up in. Most of us interpret baptism through a lens of tradition and not through a lens of Scripture. And here's what we know about tradition. Tradition always evokes emotion. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. I'm going to ask you to just to set aside your baptism filter, because we all have one. Just lay your filter down, and let's just look with some clarity at the Word of God and see what it says. Now, from my own study of the Bible, here's what I see about baptism. Baptism is not a big decision, but it is a big deal. It's not a big decision, but it is a big deal. If you've ever wondered or you're wondering now, should I get baptized, um, it requires two things. We're going to walk you through this today to help you answer that question. It requires two things. It requires faith and repentance. Now, faith is believing that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the Son of God who came to earth in the flesh who died a sinner's death on the cross and then raised from the grave on the third day to save us from our sins and to provide us with eternal life. That's what faith is. Repentance is reorienting your life around that belief. That because Jesus died for me, I'm going to live for him. Not perfectly, but progressively. I'm not always going to get it right, but I'm going to keep moving toward the heart of God as he keeps pouring his grace over top of me right so it's not perfect it's progressive our mission is in case you've forgotten to help people find and follow Jesus right this is the mission faith happens when people find Jesus that's the moment of faith repentance happens when people begin to follow Jesus The Greek word for repentance is the word metanoia, which literally means a change of mind. Like when we begin to follow Jesus, it means we have changed our mind about what's most important. We're no longer following the ways of the world. We are following Jesus because Jesus offers a better way. So faith and repentance are big decisions. Faith and repentance are big decisions. Baptism is the simple step that follows Jesus that if you believe in Jesus and you want to follow Jesus you've already made the big decision and the right decision and so baptism is really just the simple step that follows this is how every conversion story goes throughout the book of Acts so Acts is the historical account of the beginnings of Christianity over about the first 30 years or so of uh, of the church as it grew from a few a handful of followers to, to a movement. And in Acts chapter 2, we talked about this a few weeks ago, Peter preaches the first gospel message about who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished. And the crowd found Jesus. They believed his message. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God who died for our sins and rose from the grave on the third day. And then they asked this question, what must we do to be saved? What do we have to do? We believe this, now what? And Peter says this, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nobody in the crowd that we're aware of got hung up on baptism. Nobody pushed back. Nobody was like, okay, is that, is that really necessary? I mean, do we really need to do that? Isn't faith enough? That was not the posture of this crowd, and here's why. A verse earlier, 37. When the people heard this, when they heard the gospel message, they were cut to the heart. There was conviction. There was remorse. There was humility. If this is who Jesus was, and if this is what Jesus accomplished, then what must we do? What must I do? Do And so if your attitude around baptism is, do I really need to do that? Then my question to you is, have you really been cut to the heart over your sin and over his sacrifice? Because if you understand the significance of the cross, then baptism is an easy decision. 
And that's what we see all throughout the book of Acts. In Acts 8, Philip is having a conversation with an Ethiopian. He's explaining uh, the book of Isaiah to him. He's explaining the gospel to him. And they come up to, to some water, and the Ethiopian says, well, here's water. What hinders me? There was faith. There was repentance. Then baptism. In Acts 9, Paul has this dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Jesus found him. And when Jesus, the Jesus you don't believe in shows up to you, you change directions, right? There's repentance. There's metanoia. So Paul decides to follow Jesus and be baptized. There's faith. There's repentance. And then there's baptism. In Acts 10, Peter takes the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time, specifically to the house of Cornelius. And he and his entire household are baptized after hearing the message. There is faith, there is repentance, and then there is baptism. In Acts 16, Paul shares the gospel. And a lady named Lydia is cut to the heart, and she is baptized. There is faith, there is repentance, and then there is baptism. In that same chapter, Paul shares the gospel with the jailer uh, that's in charge of the prison where he's being held captive, and, and the jailer... Uh, accepts Jesus. His entire family is baptized. There's faith. There's repentance. There's baptism. Every one of those conversion stories are the same. There was a message about Jesus. Then there was belief in Jesus. That's faith. Then there was a decision to follow Jesus. That's repentance. And the immediate next step was to be baptized. Not someday, but today. Their mind was changed, their life was changed, and that change was demonstrated through baptism. So baptism was not a big decision in the book of Acts. Faith and repentance were big decisions. Baptism was just a simple step that followed. But baptism is a big deal, so I want to lay out for you the rest of our time together. I'm going to lay out for you a few reasons why baptism is a big deal and why you should be baptized. The first reason why baptism is a big deal is because Jesus commanded it. Jesus commanded it. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago in our disciple-making culture message, that one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples was to go and make disciples. That's the mission he handed us as the church. He said the way you do that is by baptizing them and teaching them to obey all of my commands. And so what that tells us is that baptism is essential to discipleship. If Jesus has made disciples by baptizing them, then one can't be a disciple unless one is baptized, right? I mean, we just follow that to its logical conclusion. If you're to make disciples by baptizing people, then one can't be a disciple if one is not baptized. Now, in the time of Jesus, there were two types of people in the world. There were Jews and there were Gentiles. That's it. That's how the world was divided. All right, the only way to become a Jew, you had two, two options. You had to be born a Jew or through rebirth. If you weren't born a Jew, you, you could convert to Judaism through a spiritual rebirth. So Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism had to go through several rituals. They had to be circumcised if they were a male. They had to share in a covenant meal. They had to acknowledge and submit to the law of Moses. And then they had to be ceremonial, ceremonially washed. That's a mouthful. Ceremonially washed washed. And you know why they weren't hung up on the washing? Because they got circumcised. Listen, <laughs> if that's not going to stop you, what else will, right? So at least we don't do that. All right. And sorry. And the word for washing, the word for washing was the word baptizo, which means dip or dunk. And this is where we get our English word baptism. Then a guy named John came along and he began preaching a new message and his message was for Jewish people it was for the nation of Israel John was the cousin of Jesus his sole purpose in life the entire reason he was born was to prepare the people for the ministry and teaching of Jesus and so he stood on the banks of the Jordan River he preached about the coming of the kingdom of God and that the Messiah was coming and that God was going to do something brand new and that if they wanted to be part of this brand new thing that God was doing they had to repent they had to change their mind about the way they were living about the direction they were moving and then they needed to be baptizoed they needed to be baptized they needed to be cleansed 
So Judaism was a temporary religious system that God established to keep Israel pure and holy for the coming of the Messiah because Jesus would come through that nation and he would come through that nation to then begin to do a new thing. And now the Messiah had arrived and John was announcing that something brand new was coming and his baptism was their ceremonially ceremonial cleansing. This is what would allow them to associate now with the kingdom of God. And so they gave him a nickname, right? He became John the Baptizer. Now, we call him John the Baptist, but he wasn't Baptist. He was Presbyterian. So I don't know why, but it's John the Baptizer. Jews came from all over Israel to hear his message. Because they were ready for something new. The law was too much to bear. It was pressing them down. And that was by design. It was intended to point them and the rest of the world to the new way of Jesus. And so thousands of people flocked to this spot at the Jordan River where John was baptizing. They came to hear his message, and they were baptized by him. And many of them thought John was the Messiah. And John's like, not I. Not I. I'm not it. He said, I, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here's what he meant by that. It's my baptism is a baptism of intention. But the Messiah's baptism is a baptism of transformation. My baptism is just the opening act for the main event. And one day while John was baptizing people in the Jordan, Jesus shows up and John looks up and he sees him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He's like, this is the guy. This is the guy I've been telling you about. This is the guy right here who's coming to usher in the kingdom of God. This is the guy who's coming to do something brand new. That's the Messiah. And then Jesus walks down to the Jordan River and he walks up to John and he says, John, I need you to baptize me. And John's like, what? I can't baptize you. You baptize me. And Jesus said, no, I need you to baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus wasn't going to be baptized to be cleansed. He was sinless. He was being baptized to validate John's message of the coming of the kingdom of God and to identify with the people he was coming to save, that now he was one of them and he was going to die for all of them. And the gospels tell us that when Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And it was in this moment moment that Jesus was inaugurated to do the thing he came to do. He was inaugurated for his ministry. He was inaugurated for his teaching, and he was infused with the Holy Spirit. And Mark chapter 1 gives us the condensed version of, of, of these events. And so after his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, Jesus comes out in Mark 1.15, and he begins his ministry by saying this, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This was the same message that John was preaching. And now Jesus is taking up the mantle from John. John hands Jesus the the torch, and now the focus turns to Jesus' message and ministry about the kingdom of God. And if he's going to teach this new thing, it was necessary for him as a Jewish man to be baptized into this new thing. In other words, Jesus was wearing what he was selling. He was wearing what he was selling. And the second reason we need to be baptized is that reason right there, that Jesus did it. He didn't just command it. He actually did it. Following Jesus means that we're following his example to be baptized. It's a rebirth. In fact, Jesus talks about it as being born again in John chapter 3. He has this conversation with a religious leader, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is curious about Jesus' teaching And here's here's the conversation, verse verse 3 of John 3. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, 
Nicodemus believed that Israel was the kingdom of God. And he was part of the leadership group that, that wrote the rules for how Gentiles could become Jewish and, and, and be welcomed into the kingdom of God. But he didn't understand, as Jesus was talking, he didn't understand how this applied to him. So verse 4, he says, how can someone be born when they are old? So Nicodemus is asking for a friend here, right? This is about him. How can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. He's saying, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm already Jewish. I'm already in the kingdom of God. So are you, are you talking about like a literal rebirth? And Jesus is like, no, I'm doing something brand new. This is not about Jews. This is not about Gentiles. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. He's saying the kingdom of God is for everybody. And the way, Nicodemus, you get into the kingdom of God is the same way a Gentile becomes a Jew. There's a spiritual component, which is internal, that only the Spirit can do. And that happens through our faith and through our repentance. And there's this physical component, which is external, that you have to do. And that's to be washed, to be cleansed, to be baptized. John's baptism was with water. But John said, one's coming after me that will, baptize, that will baptize you with the Spirit. So Jesus takes water and Spirit. And just like a Gentile has to be cleansed of their Gentileness to become Jewish, Jewish, Jesus was telling Nicodemus that he had to be cleansed of his Jewishness to enter the kingdom of God. Baptism is a public demonstration of a new association. And through your baptism, you were following the example of Jesus and publicly demonstrating your new association with the kingdom of God. We have a brand new outlook and we have brand new priorities. And that's the third reason to be baptized. It marks new life in Christ. Your baptism marks your new life in Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Baptism in the early church was the demonstration that someone was in Christ. Right? Because faith and, and repentance are internal things. But when they were baptized, everybody could know. That's a follower of Jesus. They are in the militia of Jesus. It's a spiritual picture of this physical reality. Water has this cleansing and renewing effect. When you've, when you've done a hard workout at the gym, when you weren't working on that six-pack, and you're a sweaty mess, or you, you've done you know, working in the yard or whatever, and you're just a sweaty mess, I mean, what's the first thing you want to do after you take in some water, right? You want to take a shower. Because it cleanses you and it renews you. You come out of the shower feeling like a new person. Water is used throughout Scripture to represent this idea of new. The flood in Genesis 9 was about cleansing the earth and bringing something new. In Exodus 14, God rescues Israel by parting the Red Sea so they can cross on dry ground. They were saved through the water. And God then on the other side forms a new nation. In Joshua 3, God stops the Jordan River from flowing so Israel can cross and take possession of the promised land. It was the mark of a new season in their story of redemption. Throughout redemptive history, water has represented cleansing and renewal. And the Apostle Paul taps into this idea in Romans chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. We've changed our mind. We've changed our direction. We're no longer that person. We've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Well, what does that mean, John? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. To be buried with Christ in his death means to have all of the saving benefits of his death. 
which is forgiveness of sins, i.e. redemption. And then we're raised up with him in new life. So this refers to the initial act of the Holy Spirit. Just just as Jesus' baptism inaugurated his ministry, our baptism inaugurates our ministry. It sets us apart as ambassadors for Jesus, and we're infused with the Holy Spirit, which brings new hope and new priorities, a new heart, new mind. We've been changed. We've been changed. The former me is dead. The new me is raised up by the power of God's spirit to new life in Christ. And baptism is a beautiful picture of this transaction. A person stands in the water to declare death to their old way of living. They go under the water, which represents burial. And they come up out of the water, which represents this newness of life. But here's the thing. It really has nothing to do with the water. There's nothing magical about the water. I mean, this is false advertising. Because it's not holy water. It's normal water. But it's a holy moment. It's a holy moment because of the power of the Holy Spirit to make us brand new. So when you come out of the water, you're not dripping holy water. You're dripping Holy Spirit. You're dripping new life in Christ. And so baptism is a big deal. But it's not a big decision. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, that's a big decision. Baptism is just a simple step that follows. And so if you believe in Jesus and you're ready to follow him, this is your next step. If you're already a Jesus follower, but you haven't been baptized, you need to take this step. You missed first base. Let's come back around and pick it up. If you're a follower of Jesus who was sprinkled as an infant, you need to take this step. And this is where it gets emotional. But you need to take this step, and here's why. Because baptism is a personal decision. If you were sprinkled as an infant, that decision was made for you. And to be baptized as an adult, hear me on this because I know this is so many people's story. To be baptized as an adult is not disrespecting your parents. It is honoring your parents to be a Jesus follower. That's the reason they had you baptized in the first place. They wanted to set a foundation in your life that you would grow up in faith. So listen, take the emotion out of the equation and take ownership of your faith and make the decision for yourself and then thank your parents for instilling faith in you. Thank them for setting the foundation for you to be a thriving Jesus follower. In Acts chapter 19, this is not on the screen, uh, but Paul is in Ephesus and he runs into some believers there and he asks them, them this question. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they replied, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. He said, then what baptism did you experience? They replied, the baptism of John. It's the only baptism they knew. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. His baptism was a baptism of intention, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized. There was no pushback. There was no emotion. There was like, well, didn't my first one count? No, there was none of that. Like Paul just explained a little more, a little more detail. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. I'm in. And some of you, that's the journey that you're on. You've been following Jesus for a long time, but you've never been baptized. And so listen, this is what Scripture teaches about baptism. So just remove the emotion and take the step. And so if you're wondering if you should get baptized today, here, here's, here's, the, here's the question. This is the, this is the question that you have to ask yourself. Do I believe that Jesus is who he said he was? 
And am I ready to deny myself and follow him into the abundant life that he promises? That's the question. If you're a yes to those two things, you're a yes to faith and you're a yes to repentance, so you should be a yes to baptism. It is not a salvation issue. It is an obedience issue. Here's the question we get all the time. Is baptism essential for salvation? Okay, here's my answer. Faith is essential for salvation. Baptism is essential for following Jesus. Now, you can't do this if you don't have this. But if you have this, why would you not do this? If you have faith, why would you not be baptized? And so the the Ethiopian in Acts 8 asks a really good question of Philip. Here's water. What hinders me? And so that's the question I want you to ask yourself. Like, this is the wrong question. That's just the wrong question. The question is, if you have faith, why not? And so so here's the the follow-up question to that. What hinders me? I want you to just do some self-reflection on that. What hinders me? What's standing in my way? I can only think of two things. There may be more. I think it's fear or pride. Like fear, I don't want to do it in front of people because I've never, ever, ever swam anywhere in front of people ever before. Come on. Fear of water. Okay, I can understand that. Listen, I'm a certified lifeguard. It's not true. I'm uncertified. (laughs) It's not deep. Or pride. You know what? I'm just not, I I don't want to do it. Fear and pride are not the ways of Jesus. Fear and pride are not the ways uh, of Jesus. The way of Jesus is faith and humility. And so it really then comes down to a repentance issue. Am I really living a repentant life if I'm not willing to do this? So, what hinders you? What hinders you? I've given you three reasons. Three reasons to be baptized. Let me give you one reason not to. Only one. If you don't believe. That's the only reason. And that's where some of you are. And that is absolutely okay. You're trying to figure this whole Jesus thing out. Man, I'm glad you're here. I hope you keep coming or I hope you keep tuning in online. I hope you keep exploring this idea of faith. I hope you ask some questions. And I hope you find Jesus. But if you've already made that decision, you've already made the big decision. So take the simple step of baptism. Take the plunge into the power and promise of Jesus to make you brand new someday. And here is that day. October 10th is Baptism Sunday. And here's all you have to do. And this is what we do every week, right? Text decision, text this word decision to this number right here. And it will shoot back a simple form for you to fill out and then allow us to connect with you and give you some more details uh, about that day. We already have several people that are signed up. You're not going to be alone. It's going to be a great day of celebrating life change, and you will get a new baptism T-shirt. It will not be this one, okay? (laughs) It says, I got baptized at Center Point, and all I got was this T-shirt. That's what it says on it. So I'm just kidding. Doesn't say that either, guys. I'll be here all week, y'all. <laughs> no, it says brand new. And so uh, if, you, if you know you need to do this, listen, don't walk out of here without texting over here. And if you don't want to text, we got decision cards on the communion and offering tables in the back. You can fill one of those out, drop it in the box, and that will allow us to connect with you and get some details. But don't walk out of here without taking this step. Stop saying someday. This is the day. This is your some day. Okay? Let me pray for you. Father, I, I'm grateful for 
your word that's instructive, and I pray today that your word does what your word does best, and that is convict. That the writer of Hebrews says your word is living and active. That means it, it's moving in us, it's transforming us. And so I, I just pray that forever, for whomever today has been on the fence, that, that scripture would have provided clarity. And if they need more clarity, that they would have conversations with people who are further down the discipleship journey than they are. But Father, we are a church. We want to continue to be a church where transformation happens, where new life is marked. And so, God, I pray that your spirit will be working in the hearts of every one of us about what it truly means to have found you and to be following you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you're not sure that, that you believe and you want to talk to somebody about uh, this decision of faith or what faith means in Jesus, you can text the same word to the very same number. You just check the box that says, I want to talk to someone about beginning a relationship with Jesus. That will allow someone from our team to get in touch with you and have that conversation and answer some questions for you, maybe pray with you uh, as well. Uh, anybody today that wants to be prayed for, our prayer team is going to be down front right here. So as everybody else is making their way out the exit doors, you can make your way to the front and we'd be honored to pray uh, with you and for you today. You guys have a great week, and we'll see you next week for part three of Someday.